campus radio station is going to be in action. An interviewer is interviewing a man from the university for the survey. Listen to the conversation between them and circle the best answer from A, B, or C for questions 1 to 4. You now have some time to read questions 1 to 4. Now, we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will never hear the recording for the second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 4. Excuse me, I'm conducting a campus survey. Would you have time to answer a few questions? What's it all about? We're doing some market research for a new campus radio station starting in the next few months. That's OK. Sounds good. Great. I'll just work through this form with you. And if we could start with some personal background information? Sure. Right. If I could have your age, please. 26. OK, good. And are you a student, teacher or in another job? Well, I'm a tutor, but I'm also a postgraduate student, so I don't know what you might call me. What do you think? OK, well, I'm more of a teacher, really. Fine. And would you mind if I asked about your salary, or I could leave it blank? No, that's OK. It's $20,000 a year. Thanks. Right. Now about your current listening habits. What would you say is your main reason for listening to radio? Well, I'm usually busy during the day at work, so I usually only listen to the radio at night. It helps me relax and unwind, even if I'm studying. Good. And how many hours a day on average do you listen to the radio? Well, not a lot really. I'd say just over an hour all told. Now you have some time to read questions 5 to 10. Now listen to the second part of the interview and answer questions 5 to 10. So, what are the two main times of the day that you listen to the radio? Well, for a little while around breakfast time, and then it tends to be later, after dinner, when I've finished any serious work I need to do. And what sort of radio programmes do you like? I like the news, but I also like classical music. It helps me to relax. Fine. And turning to the new campus station, which type of programmes would you prefer? I think the existing radio stations cater for my need for news. So I'd like to see programmes about local information, you know, providing a service to the campus community. And in the same vein, perhaps more for academic viewers, you know, some lectures or relevant programmes. Oh, I see. And if you had to give the new directors some specific advice when they set up the station, what would you tell them? I think I'd advise them to be careful about the quality of the broadcasts. You know, the sound system. There are a lot of radio stations and people can change their loyalty quickly if it doesn't meet their needs. I think they should do more of these kinds of interview too, you know, talking with existing and potential customers. Oh, I'm pleased you think it's useful. Certainly, yeah. Good. Now, this station will not be fully funded by the university. So how often do you think it is tolerable to have adverts? I think, well, out of that list, I'd say every quarter of an hour. Of course, that's providing they don't last for ten minutes each time. Oh, quite. And are you interested in attending any of the special promotions for the new station? Yes, I'd be happy to. 
as long as they're held on the campus or nearby. OK, I'll note that down. And finally, may we put you on our mailing list? Well, I prefer not, except for the information about the promotions you just mentioned. OK. Can I have your name and address? Of course. I have a card I can give you. Oh, great. And thanks a lot for your time, and we look forward to seeing you. Yeah, sure. Mm, thanks. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a speech given by the head of a company to some new employees. You have 30 seconds to look at questions 11 to 16. First of all, a warm welcome to Barker's Country Safaris. We're delighted to have you all on board for this season. I know you've all been told a bit about the company when you had your job interview, but I thought it would be worth telling you a bit more about ourselves. Barker's was set up ten years ago by myself, John, and my then-girlfriend and now wife, Nancy. We started it initially just as a hobby, we felt that there was a good opportunity to share our love of the countryside in this part of the world with the many visitors who come here. As you know, most people come for the beaches in the summer, but there is so much more to the region, and this is what we wanted to exploit. Nancy and I were born near here, and as teenagers we went climbing, kayaking, white water rafting, potholing, and just straightforward walking. This district is in our blood, and we love it. <laughs> While we were still at university, we started taking small groups of visitors out into the National Park in Nancy's brother's old Land Rover. We'd drive them around the back lanes and into the forest. We'd also organise rock climbing tours for friends of friends. Then, each year, without us having to advertise, people came back to us to ask for more excursions and trips. So... Five years ago, we gave up our other jobs to focus full-time on Barker's Country Safaris. Now, two years after that, we set up the activity tour part of the business, and one year ago, we expanded into organising activities for school groups during term time. Obviously, this was a massive challenge with all the health and safety requirements, but it's proving a great success. You now have 30 seconds to look at questions 17 to 20. Anyway, we'll certainly not be dealing with school parties during the summer holidays. Our clients for the next three months are mostly family parties or groups of friends, and I'd like to talk a bit now about the tours we offer and what your responsibilities will be. Our most popular excursion is the Woodland Tour and Trail, 
Now, often this is sold out and we have all of our 10 Jeeps in convoy with eight people in each Jeep. It's a lot of fun. These tours really offer a taster of what we can provide. So as both driver and guide, it is important that you do a good job here so they come back for the bigger tours. Uh, I will talk about the commission package later. As the summer days are so long, we have three tours each day, but you will not be expected to work on more than two of them. Morning tours start at 8 a.m. and go to midday. Afternoon tours are from 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. and then evening ones, 7 p.m. to 11 p.m. All the tours follow the same route and you should have made yourselves familiar with all the key information. This was provided to you in the information pack you were sent when you accepted the job offer. This is important, so if you haven't had time yet, please do so now. Our second most popular tour is the Family Exclusive. Now, this tour is for the whole day and for only one group. Usually it is just one Jeep, but sometimes there are two if the party is large. These tours go from 10 a.m. till 5 p.m. and include lunch at the Brown Bear in Lower Middleton. We have a number of different routes for these tours as we don't want our premium clients being made to feel that they are part of a large package deal. Uh, you will be told which route to take with your weekly schedule. Now, I'd like to move on to these specialty tour packages. These are the ones that we are keen to book people on once they've done the woodland tour and trail trip. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. I have with me today Matthew East, a registered osteopath and a supporter of alternative techniques in healthcare. Matthew, can you tell us more about osteopathy? First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Over the past 50 years, there have been some radical changes in medicine as it is known in the West. This is largely the result of vast improvements in technology, but also in the rising importance of alternative treatments. I have with me today Matthew East, a registered osteopath and a supporter of alternative techniques in healthcare. Matthew, can you tell us more about osteopathy? Well, perhaps the first thing I should say is that the term alternative is actually a little misleading, as I am referring to approaches and attitudes to health that were in common use long before Western medicine was established. I prefer the term natural. Anyway, I'll begin by telling you a little about osteopathy. Basically, osteopathy is the manipulation of muscles in order to alleviate stresses and tensions that lead to pain. Now, unlike Western medicine, osteopathy considers the whole body, not just the affected area. And this is a very important principle of natural remedies. The whole body must be considered before a course of treatment can be decided upon. You see, the aim of therapies like osteopathy is not only to repair the body, but also to get the body treating itself, 
and this does not come from treating the symptoms. To give an example, I recently treated a two-month-old baby who was screaming all day and was even worse at night. The couple had taken the baby to their doctor, but the only advice they were given was that the baby would grow out of it. However, the real problem stemmed from a difficult birth, which put pressure on the baby's neck. After ten minutes of gentle manipulation, the pressure was released, and within twenty minutes the baby was quiet and calm for the first time. This was achieved without drugs or operations. Avoiding such invasive methods of treatment highlights another of the differences between Western medicine and a more natural approach. You see, Western medicine often uses surgery in order to find a solution to problems that could have been addressed with simple remedies. A medical approach that looks closely at how essential an operation is before it is performed would offer patients a considerably less stressful method of treatment, not to mention the financial savings. Natural remedies actually amount to about 10% of the cost of a Western course of treatment. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. I'd like to mention the subject of surgery again a little later, but I would like to say at this point that there are those that claim that the benefits of osteopathy and herbal therapies are largely psychological, that they have not undergone the clinical trials that pharmaceuticals have. To answer that, you only need to look at the example I gave earlier of the baby that stopped crying less than an hour after treatment, but was obviously far too young to react because of purely psychological factors. Another example can be seen in the successful use of acupuncture in the treatment of animals. In response to criticism regarding clinical trials, it is worth noting that the power of pharmaceutical companies is such that, although some drugs fail the standards required of them, they are sometimes still prescribed by doctors. Moving on to another point, it should be stressed that natural remedies, in addition to having no side effects, can also be applied to any patient. Now, I'm not suggesting that the same treatments are used indiscriminately. Although natural remedies can be used with any age group, the treatment selected is very specific to the person. By this I mean that not only the general health of the patient needs to be considered, but also their habits, diet and lifestyle in order to build a complete picture. However, I am not suggesting that we should reject Western medicine entirely. In fact, there have been occasions when I have referred patients to their doctors, as I felt that in those cases it was the most suitable course of action. There are many situations in which it is by far the best option. Take emergency surgery, for example. Obviously, more natural remedies do not provide the speed required in such cases. The best solution would therefore be an open-minded combination of the two forms. Well, thank you very much, Matthew. That was a very interesting insight into alternative, sorry, natural treatments. Next week, we'll be inviting Dr. Moore. That's M-O-O-R-E onto the programme to argue his case as a doctor. Until next week, then, goodbye. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. 
you will hear a biology lecture about tubularia. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Hello, everyone. I'm glad so many people have shown up here today to hear about these fascinating little creatures called the Turbularia. My name is Dr. Baker, and I've spent 20 years researching thousands of different species of platyhelminths, what are commonly known as flatworms, both free-living and parasitic. So there are a lot of things I could tell you about these extremely interesting invertebrate, but I will try to keep it short. Turbularia are unique amongst flatworms in three ways. The first one is that, unlike 80% of all platyhelminths, turbularia do not need to secure nourishment from a living source. This means that they do not generally parasitize a host, but are instead found living freely in the environment. So, no need to worry about any of these little samples I've got here escaping and causing havoc. The second way in which they're different is that they are, well, they're incredibly simple. And by simple, I don't mean in terms of structure, as their structure is indeed quite complex, and I'll get to that later. By simple, I mean that they're not the brightest bulbs in the box. Flatworms in general are not known for their cognitive abilities especially when compared with other invertebrates such as cuttlefish or octopuses or even insects. But amongst flatworms, turbularia are by far the most primitive of the bunch. Finally, and this is a direct result of the first thing I mentioned, turbularia tend to have a much more complicated sensory system in their head region. This includes a set of eyes with receptors that can detect light, as well as chemical sensory organs that assist turbularia in locating food. Obviously, as other flatworms receive nutrition directly from their host, they have no need for this. Despite these three differences, however, turbularia are quite similar to other flatworms in all sorts of other ways. First of all, as their name suggests, they're incredibly flat, which allows them to hide under stones. They're symmetrical on both sides, and they don't have a body cavity. They also don't have any specialized respiratory, skeletal, and circulatory systems. What they do have, however, and this is what I meant when I referenced their structure before, is three layers known as the endoderm, the mesoderm, and the ectoderm, as well as a head region where their brain and sense organs are located, and a spongy connective tissue that fills all the space between their organs. Finally, like most species of flatworms, they're hermaphrodites, this means that a single flatworm has a set of each gender. But don't take this to mean they reproduce alone. Their preferred method of reproduction is called cross-fertilization, which means that each flatworm fertilizes the other. I mentioned before that most flatworms need a host, but turbularia feed from the environment. So what do they feed on? Most turbularia can be found either in fresh or salt water and they feed on small insects, microscopic matter, and crustaceans. They will pretty much eat anything they find. They have no preference on whether their food is living or dead. Also, and this is the most remarkable part about their eating habits, also, and this is the most remarkable part about their eating habits, if they ever find themselves in a situation where food is scarce, they might also feed on themselves. That's right, they'll start eating their own body, starting with the least essential muscles and organs and working their way up. They will shrink in size until they're able to find food again, at which point they'll begin to regenerate everything they've lost. One final thing about food, and apologies in advance if I disgust you, turbularia don't possess an anus, which means that their mouth, which is a muscular opening on the underside of their body, has to serve as one. Before I finish this presentation, one more thing you've probably heard before but weren't sure if it was a myth or not. 
I mentioned already that turbillaria can reproduce on their own, but there's a second method they can use, which is known as fission. Now, as a child, you were probably told that if you cut a worm in half, it will grow into two new worms. That's not entirely true, but flatworms are not worms exactly, and they do have the ability to regenerate by splitting into two, perhaps even more smaller parts, at which point each part regrows the missing organs and becomes a brand new turbillarian. Now this is extremely important for us, and this is how I'd like to close this presentation, because their ability to regenerate endlessly makes them virtually immortal, and it might open pathways to regeneration in human cells or slowing the human aging process, which is why scientists like myself have been studying these unique creatures, hoping to get some answers. Thank you for listening, and please come along to see me and my samples if you have any further questions. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.